Hi everyone and welcome to Caring's Women in Motion Talks. I'm Elizabeth Wagmeister, Variety's Chief Correspondent, and we are very excited for our next conversation with Lily Gladstone. After her breakout role in the film Certain Women, Lily has landed her largest role to date in Martin Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon, starring opposite Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro. Just hours before the premiere at Cannes, we're about to sit down with Lily Gladstone.
Oh, wow. Wow, look at this view. It's right here. This is beautiful. Hi. Hello. 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 We're going to have... Oh. Ready, ready, ready. Look at the camera. Look at me. Lily, for me, please. Lily, down. Down in the middle. In the meantime, if you could turn up the whole thing. On your left. On your left. Just to the top row. Just a bit up. And to the top, to the top. Downstairs, downstairs. I think that's a precursor of what's coming tonight. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Seeing stars, right? Yes. How does it feel to be in Cannes? Incredible. Look at this. It's beautiful. It's, um, it's funny. Everybody's been apologizing for the weather because it's always so beautiful and sunny mm -hmm. here. Uh, I, when people watch the film, maybe we'll understand why it feels really good to be seeing the rain. Mm -hmm. I, think it's, I think it's a special thing, and it sounds like a... Sounds like the area's really needed it, so I'm grateful mm -hmm. that the weather is what it is. Yes. I'm grateful my introduction to Cannes is a rainy one. Mm -hmm. it's, it's what the land needs right now. Mm -hmm. Now, no pressure, but how does it feel right now knowing that in five, six, seven hours from now <laughs> that you're having this huge moment at the premiere at the Palais? How are you feeling right now? You know, I, I got to... I was blessed enough to be able to have seen this film already. Mm -hmm. So I'm mostly just excited for more people to see what Marty's created mm -hmm. and to see the story that's being told and to learn about the Osage Reign of Terror mm -hmm. and not just the Reign of Terror, which of course is the platform for this story, but about mm -hmm. Osage cultural perseverance and survival, which is the heart of the film. And that's... Um, that's the piece that I'm so grateful to be a part of, not being Osage, being Native, and mm -hmm. coming from the Blackfeet and as First Nations myself, we have our own histories, but the mm -hmm. Osage Reign of Terror and Osage Resilience mm -hmm. <laughs> in um, light of the Reign of Terror is just such an incredible, important story, and it deserves to have the kind of platform that, that can and Martin Scorsese have given it. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you were familiar with this story before you landed this part. Uh, a bit, yeah, yeah. You were, okay. So you knew about this when you signed on? Yes. Um, like a lot of the world, I became way more familiar with the intricacies of it and mm -hmm. uh, with David Grant's book. Mm -hmm. Growing up, I'd heard about it. Um, I grew up on the Blackfeet Reservation. My father's, um, on my father's side is mm -hmm. Blackfeet and Nez Perce. So in Browning and East Glacier, Montana is uh, where I came up, and they're very rural, small communities. Mm -hmm. My mother has a background in education, so by the time I was in fifth grade, we decided mm -hmm. I would homeschool that year, mm -hmm. and my mother helped create my curriculum. Was, um, we didn't have access to a Montessori education, but she really mm -hmm. believed in self-directed learning, as do I. Mm -hmm. You know, every human is intelligent, and every human has something to say, and your interest is kind of what speaks to what your purpose is. Mm -hmm. So that was the tack that my, um, my parents took in creating my education that year. And I was a dancer before I ever acted. Mm. Ballet was, ballet and performance was an avenue for this expressive nature mm -hmm. that I had. Mm -hmm. So 
I took a very strong interest in Maria Tallchief because mm -hmm. I had a love of ballet and my mom tuned me into her because she was America's first prima ballerina who was from the Osage Nation. Maria Tallchief is, is Osage. Mm -hmm. Actually, the blankets that you see me wearing in the film, and so far all of the blankets that have been photographed in, um, those are Tall Chief family blankets, 100-year-old mm. uh, blankets that I'm wearing. That was a gift of the Tall Chief family. Mm. Um, but anyways, when I was homeschooling that year, and in learning about Maria Tall Chief, and in mm. learning about her history as this incredible dancer, she was married to George Balanchine for a while, if anybody needs the, <laughs> the, the name recognition. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, she was so incredibly influential. And when I was learning about her being Osage, my dad had told me not a lot. He probably told me more than I was able to remember or recall as a fifth grader. Mm -hmm. But I do remember feeling very concerned and scared for Maria's family because dad told me about Osage people mm -hmm. being murdered for their oil wealth. Mm -hmm. He said she was able to be a ballerina because Osage had a lot of money from oil mm -hmm. and people were killing them for it. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what I remember of it. And mm -hmm. specifically what I remember of it is being worried about Maria Tallchief. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but when Grand's book came out, seeing just how this was such a widespread thing that still, you know, this isn't that many generations ago. Mm -hmm. This is in very recent memory. This is in very recent family history. Mm -hmm. It's had a very lasting impact. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's beyond the story that you see. It's beyond this, um, this group, this family that was targeted by William Hale, Robert De Niro's character. Mm -hmm. um, and the cases that were tried were a, a couple dozen. Um, and in the film, you know, it references like maybe 30. Mm -hmm. There were hundreds of Osage that were killed during this time. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of ways that you will see in the film, in very insidious, quiet ways that are difficult to really track and prove. But um, yeah, and then learning about not just the lasting impact that this, this had um, two individual families but to the whole community, mm -hmm. how it shifted the way culture kind of had to adapt. Mm -hmm. Not, yeah, in some ways culture, like the, the dances that are so central to Osage had to move to a different time of year because so many people had left the reservation, leaving the reign of terror. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of Osages and a lot of American Indians live in urban locations mm -hmm. away from reservations and because their dances are so much about community. When they had been a time when community was naturally together, the reign of terror drove so many people away mm -hmm. um, for safety mm -hmm. <laughs> that they changed the time of the year that the big community dances happened to accommodate for people to be able to come home in the summers. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, that's, that's a big deal. It's a big deal for an entire, an entire group of people to change course, but that's that's what you do to protect, to mm -hmm. preserve, to, to carry onward. Mm -hmm. We have a few things in common. My mom is in education, and I also grew up as a ballet dancer. Nice. So look at that. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about how you got this role. How did this come to you? <sighs> <laughs> um, it always feels like by magic, right? Mm -hmm. So I had... Pretty, a pretty clean actor's journey. You know, mm -hmm. you get the call from the casting director, and in this case, I had two casting directors that were bringing me in for it. Mm -hmm. One being the indigenous casting, or the casting director of indigenous actors in this, Renee Haynes. She herself is not indigenous, so just making sure. But um, Renee Haynes is somebody who's been in the business working for a long time. Mm -hmm. Actually, her very first job as a casting assistant was on a film by Frank Rodham called War Party. Mm -hmm. Frank Rodham also did one called Quadrophenia that's a little bit more um, uh, culturally known. But Frank Rodham shot this independent film, War Party, on my reservation when mm -hmm. I was two years old. My father was a rigger mm -hmm. on the crew. He was the crew's rigger. Mm -hmm. And um, it was Renee Haynes's first casting assistant job. Mm -hmm. So uh, Flash forward, I'm in my early 20s. I meet her doing another project, mm -hmm. and she's been advocating for me since then. Mm -hmm. So Renee, of course, 
put my name out there, but it sounds like from what Ellen Lewis said, it was already on her radar as well. Mm -hmm. So both women brought me into Ellen, Ellen Lewis's office. We had just a quick touching base, mm -hmm. did the self tape, did the call back and then COVID happens. Um, and everything that I'd been reading about it, I was wondering if the project was going to continue because mm -hmm. I knew it had took, taken several years. Mm -hmm. I know what an immense story it is and how, you know, it's a, it's, it's a difficult sell for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, like these histories have been a difficult sell mm -hmm. to studios. Um, thankfully, Apple took what Leo and Marty wanted to do to change it. Mm -hmm. So that period of time during COVID, I think really changed the gravity of Molly mm -hmm. in the story, which mm -hmm. is so important. She mm -hmm. is absolutely the heartbeat of this entire narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and in the book, anybody who's read Grand's book, Molly is just who you feel for the most in reading it. Mm -hmm. So I have no idea what it would have been like before, but the, the time that um, Leo and Marty and Eric took to do this revamp and rewrite of it over COVID, mm -hmm. I just, I just know the sides that I got on the other side of COVID looked quite different. Mm -hmm. But it was um, October of that year. In August, I kind of started detaching from the idea that, you know, nobody knew what the future held as far mm -hmm. as what the world was going to be mm -hmm. doing with COVID and so many careers changing. And um, so in August, I kind of started de detaching from the idea of pursuing it traditionally like I had been anymore. Um, in October, I was registering for a data analytics course to just do some seasonal work with the Department of Agriculture and um, just, you know, protecting bees mm -hmm. by, by tracking these uh, giant Asian hornets that were taking over the northwest of that, that fall. So yeah, I was registering for the class. I had my credit card out, mm -hmm. typing in for at the community college uh, nearby for a data analytics course, and then had the little drop down that Marty wanted to Skype with me, or <laughs> not Skype, Zoom, I guess is the, the COVID <laughs> era version of Skype. But yeah, it was. Um, it's funny, there have been several times in my career, and I think every actor deals with this, is like, we love what we do so much, but it's such a gift to be able to do it. So you have to find a way to make your whole life feel balanced and feel mm -hmm. like in service of something that will keep you going. Mm -hmm. And every time I've kind of started stepping away from it, something's reached in and pulled me back. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I just went straight to a Skype with Marty. Um, a Zoom <laughs> with Marty. <laughs> um, we read through the scenes together a couple of times, gave me some minor adjustments. And then two weeks after that came a request to have a meeting with Leo and Marty. Mm -hmm. And that was just us visiting with each other, um, talking about the story, talking about how I saw Molly in it, um, mm -hmm. talking about ways that, you know, really the story and really felt familiar to, in, in some aspects, more the character of Molly, how she mm -hmm. felt familiar to women in my family that I've mm -hmm. been raised hearing about. My great-grandmother, Lily, mm -hmm. is... Uh, she um, she was a big access point for me in understanding women of that era. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that was what our conversation was about. And then I was expecting a chem read, a chemistry test mm -hmm. coming in the next couple of weeks. But then I just got the call from my lovely manager and agent, Jill and Sasha, that, uh, that the part was mine. And this was funny. Nobody planned it this way. Nobody intended it. And this is kind of the most magic part of it. I was offered the role... Um, officially on Molly Burkhardt's birthday. Wow. December 1st. Wow. And uh, I asked later, they didn't do that intentionally. Wow. <laughs> so. Meant to be. Yeah. So how did your upbringing uh, help influence the character of Molly? You spoke about your, your grandmother and how were you really able to bring yourself into this character? Having grown up on on my reservation, on the Blackfeet Reservation, around so many incredibly strong, resilient matriarchs. Mm -hmm. um, like, it gave me a really solid understanding of how to approach Molly and um, her steadfastness and uh, <laughs> some of her stubbornness. Mm -hmm. um, and really what was nice was all of these stories about my grandma Lily growing up I got to integrate in small ways. She had a very 
she had a very, very strong relationship with her Catholic faith, mm -hmm. as Molly does. Mm -hmm. And that was also an access point in talking to a lot of community members, um, some close friends that I have now that would share about their family during that era. Mm -hmm. And every story I was hearing about, um, about Grandma Rose, <laughs> my friend's Grandma Rose sounded so much like my Grandma Lily. Mm -hmm. Like at one point it felt like Grandma Rose and Grandma Lily were sitting somewhere watching the conversation, you know, just like agreeing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, and it, you know, they felt a lot to me from these stories like Molly, just a woman who's so dedicated to her family, who's so dedicated to her faith, mm -hmm. who's, um, kind of unfappable and all of that. Hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it's a hard thing to really spell out in specificity as anybody who has a cultural stronghold or an understanding um, will attest to, you know. You can't really describe what it feels like, your specific human experience, mm -hmm. but um, you do know when it feels right. And... I was very, very pleased that a lot of the work that I had done in talking with my family about, um, this is going to be a little bit of a tangent, but it's also a little bit of a, a magic point. Um, so the same week that I was offered Molly on Molly's birthday, um, December 4th that week, just three days after, my dad told me, you know, we have a woman in our family who was high status. This was an Indian woman with a lot of money mm -hmm. and knew how to be in high society. You should learn more about her to, mm -hmm. to understand Molly Burkhart. Um, and her name was Natawista. It means medicine snake woman. She was married to Alexander Culbertson, a fur trapper. And yeah, I mean, they had property all over Canada, all over the United States. Um, and I was learning a bit about her. I'd heard about her for years. Mm -hmm. I knew that we were related to her somehow. Mm -hmm. um, but then I get, so the day my dad sent me that was also the day that we had callbacks for all the sisters roles. Mm -hmm. And one of the actresses that plays Rita Smith in the film, Janae Collins, when we got to set together, she said, you know, we're, we're, we're relatives. Wow. And so uh, she said, my mom, her mother Gloria had been rooting for me for a long time. Mm -hmm. The first film I was cast in in Montana, Winter in the Blood, was written by a Blackfeet and Grovant author named mm -hmm. James Welch, and Gloria knew about me from that and has been telling Janae for a long time, that's our relative. Mm -hmm. And when Janae told me how we were related, it's through Natawista, mm -hmm. <laughs> this woman that my dad told me to study. Mm -hmm. Natawista is Janae's great, 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 great grandmother, mm -hmm. and my great, great, great grandfather, Red Crow, He's chief of the Blood Nation of the Kainai Nation in, in Canada. He was a signatory of Treaty 7. He's um, Natawista's nephew. So Janae and I have this family history and got to play sisters in the film. And that, the timing of that, the way that she told me, and then I started learning, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to learn about your family history from a written source. Mm -hmm. It is the thing. It is the most important thing to learn about some of your family history from your family. Mm -hmm. So Janae sharing stories about Natawista felt, <laughs> I think Natawista in a lot of ways was more bold than Molly. Mm -hmm. The way that she was in high society was felt very different and it's, you know, it's a different story, but it's also, you know, it goes to the point that um, even though audiences, when they see this, it's going to be an it's going to break a lot of people's perceptions about Native peoples. It's like mm -hmm. seeing wealthy status mm -hmm. Natives, mm -hmm. seeing an entire economy shaped by, by Osage with mm -hmm. immense oil wealth and seeing, I mean, it's, it's just an incredible, it's an incredible look at this part of history that looks strange to people if you didn't grow up knowing it, but then knowing that in my own family back to the early 1800s. Mm -hmm. We've had high society native women who have, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I want Janae to be able to tell this story about Natawista because it's her grandmother. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, she was, she was quite a character and she, I think she ruffled quite a few feathers in the high societies <laughs> that she ran in. So this film is obviously so important for all the reasons that you 
just mentioned and really showing people this side of a community that they perhaps don't know. What do you think about where Hollywood is at in terms of representation with indigenous people? You know, I'm so excited to see creators and shows like um, Reservation Dogs, which I'm blessed enough to have a role in, like Rutherford Falls, which I loved and unfortunately made it for two seasons and didn't continue forward, but Native showrunner, Native writers. You know, we've got Sterling Harjo, Sierra Ornelas, um, you know, Janice Schmeeding, like, and just countless others. You know, it's like everybody, everybody is booked right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kind of, it's, it's kind of like the, the folks that were used to being like able to say, yeah, I can absolutely do that for you. Mm -hmm. Now it's like we're, everybody's struggling to mm -hmm. do each other's work because there's so much of it. Right. And I think it's, it's so vital that in the 2020s, we're returning to something that felt a little bit more like the 1920s. You know, like people had a lot more interest in hearing and learning and seeing films about natives made by natives. Mm -hmm. And what's nice is that a lot of us who have been coming up in this career for a while, who have been told, you know, it's like you're a niche group, you're, it's inaccessible to a broad audience, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Anybody who watches the show Res Dogs, whether or not they have any experience, any relations, any, any ties to a reservation, can watch that show and still feel like they're being brought in. Mm -hmm. It's, um, it, it's not a huge leap to, to just watch people being people, you know? And I'm just so grateful that with all of these Native creators that are coming up and all the stories we're being told, it's giving people more permission to laugh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's, there's a resilience with Native storytellers that um, is completely embedded in humor. Mm -hmm. and I think a lot of cultures in the world who have gone through a lot of the things we have know that the way you survive as a community is, is keeping some levity, keeping some laughter. Mm -hmm. um, it's an incredibly healing thing. And it doesn't diminish any of the serious, important things that these Native creators are talking about. It, it enlightens them, you know, mm -hmm. it heightens them. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes them accessible. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's just, it's really exciting to be part of this wave. Mm -hmm and to, to have the kind of platform and the kind of master storyteller, you know, to have Scorsese take such care in this project is, mm -hmm. is incredible. And um, it's great that that's also pacing with this time when native writers, native directors, native producers, I mean, you go to Res Dogs and like, feels like 80% of the crew is indigenous mm -hmm. as well. That changes what it feels like on set. And mm -hmm. that's really exciting to mm -hmm. see. So tell me, what is it like to work with Scorsese and DiCaprio and De Niro? <laughs> 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 um, are there words for that? Right. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was like, it was like looking at Annapurna and feeling like, okay, I have to climb that. <laughs> um, but really in doing so, it's little steps. You know, mm -hmm. it's like you adjust to the altitude sickness pretty quickly. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, the first few scenes with Leo and with Bob, like I'd, I'd, broke, I'd gotten broken in with my scene work with Leo, so my hands stopped doing this <laughs> in every take, and then eventually I was able... <laughs> And then my first day opposite Bob, there it is again. Um, but you know, it's it's nice. You know, there was there was a there was an electricity that that added to it. But like I told Leo, our first week is like, I just can't think about that. Mm -hmm. Like when you're when you're working with such titans, the most refreshing thing is their people mm -hmm. and their incredible artists you know they're incredibly sensitive storytellers mm -hmm. who care about the truth of what's happening in the scene mm -hmm. who care about um, the authenticity of the relationship that's being developed mm -hmm. um, when we when we had our last day I said it 
to the crew, you know, when we were giving our little goodbyes and our statements mm -hmm. on, on the wrap, really not since I was working with a group of friends and in, you know, an art gallery basement for no money, mm -hmm. just sheer love of creation coming up with these, these plays that we mm -hmm. would do for the community. Not since then had I felt such raw, committed artistry that's mm -hmm. just about getting into the space together, stripping away every pretense and just making what we're doing as real as we possibly can mm -hmm. and doing it because we all love it so much. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was the best. It was the best experience working with these three these three incredible artists who have entire careers built on just doing what they love. At mm -hmm. a certain point, you just, you see that we all are figuring it out as we go mm -hmm. on. No matter how long your career is, no matter how established you are, it's always starting from like just square one with every mm -hmm. project, with every character. And if it doesn't, then you're probably not doing it right. Mm -hmm. So when I realized that I was incredibly nervous. It's like, well, everybody here is nervous mm -hmm. because we want to make sure we're doing this story justice. It's too important to not mm -hmm. take it seriously and to let, um, you know, there was no way I was just going to let being starstruck get in mm -hmm. the way of doing the honest work. I love how you're on a first name, nickname basis. Bob, <laughs> Marty, I get teased Leo. about that a lot. <laughs> I love it. Took, it. <laughs> it took a while for that to settle in for me too. But yes. <laughs> so what did you learn from the three of them while working with them? To just, I don't know. It's so different from each of them. Mm -hmm. Don't abandon it until, it, until you have it, mm -hmm. you know? It's, um, it's okay to feel haunted by it. You know, it's probably good that you feel haunted by it, making mm -hmm. sure that everything is so right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's the effortlessness, but also the effort is mm -hmm. really inspiring. Um, yeah, the amount of, like, I loved watching Leo work because when we're working through scenes, he's so generous and not just being there for you in the scene, but while you're talking through it, it's like he vocalizes his thought process mm -hmm. so it's just out there for you to see and to like, anticipate and like weigh in on and mm -hmm. and I really appreciate that because in a lot of ways I tend to be a lot more I don't know I don't know if it's early on just being like you know don't share your process too much wanting mm -hmm. to be guarded with it or having this um I think a lot of times newcomers have this idea that when you show up it has to be perfect mm -hmm. it has to be like perfectly rehearsed ready to go you know get it done in one take don't waste anybody's time mm -hmm. and it's like sure that's that's an important thing to aim for but it's not more important than just making sure that you're doing it in the most honest way. And sometimes mm -hmm. you have to stumble through it a little bit. You mm -hmm. have to get used to doing it. It changes when you're in the space. It changes when you're with somebody else. Um, but yeah, I think the generosity that each one of these creators, Marty too, like Marty brought, Marty just had you step in and do like, you know, a little check-in mm -hmm. every day before we would do the scene. It's like, starts telling you what, okay, so the scene's about this, we're trying to explore this, and then he kind of just like leaves it for you to add your comments. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's like a little, just a little touch base, and it, that's so important, just before starting anything, just kind of like being able to touch base and then mm -hmm. go from there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Now it sounds like you're really proud of the authenticity that was put into this project, and I know it was shot in Oklahoma where mm -hmm. these events really happened, uh, and you obviously have so much knowledge and personal experience that you could bring to this. Were you able to give input to Marty and really talk about what you wanted to achieve, not just for your role, but with the film as a whole? I was blessed enough to be welcomed by so many people in Osage country mm -hmm. by so many Osage, by so many Wajaje people mm -hmm. who were so generous with me. So like it always felt like I had a good foundation of Molly um, on my own before I got to Oklahoma and that was confirmed in conversations I had with Osage people. Mm -hmm. And to have that permission to go forward, it felt like of course there's my work and there's like my concern about 
what I'm bringing to the table. Mm -hmm. I was so aware of the fact that I was playing, and still am, like, this is a real woman. Molly Burkhart was such a strong presence in the community, especially, like, in the wake of what we see in the film, mm -hmm. that um, everything that I brought to the table for Marty and I and Leo and I to explore came from what the community really had to say. Mm -hmm. Because when you're meeting people and they know you're the one who's gonna be carrying Molly Burkhart, people are honest. They share, they share their thoughts, they share their hesitations, they, sh they share their affirmations. And that mm -hmm. was the blessing, was, was being told by people that they felt like I was a really good fit for her mm -hmm. and the kind of woman and the legacy that she has and meeting me, you know, and chalk this up to good casting. There's, there's something there where I felt like the right person for Molly and to have that mm -hmm. affirmed by Osage gave me permission to, and I always asked to, that's, that's the biggest thing when you're working in community and people are opening up and sharing stories with you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they don't always know that you might be taking that to, to your director and mm -hmm. wanting to integrate it somehow. Mm -hmm. So as I tried as best as I could to be transparent with people where it's like, I love that story you just shared with me. Is that, is that more of a, you know, lack of a better term, public domain story? Because mm -hmm. a lot of stories people open up and share with you culturally are, you know, they're, they're closed. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to be just for the community. They're for you to get context, but mm -hmm. not to share with the world. Mm -hmm. So I was careful about that, but the ones that I did have permission and the, the family stories that I had permission to share always inadvertently shaped how Marty would approach the scene. Mm -hmm. And of course, whether or not outwardly it was reflected in the narrative, every piece of information, every story, every, every piece of somebody's family or heart really that I was given and trusted with in developing mm -hmm. Molly got in somehow. Mm -hmm. So it was, um, yeah. <laughs> Do you think about, you're obviously so focused on the work and the message and the importance of representation and your portrayal of Molly, but do you think about what this role is going to do for you in terms of your career and that after tonight, it's out there in the world and then right. you have a long award season to go? Do you think about those things? I mean, you can't not, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, I anticipated I would be way more nervous mm -hmm. than, you know, like I said earlier, the analogy when you're climbing Annapurna, it's a step at a time, mm -hmm. you know, and it's mm -hmm. a slow adjustment to the altitude. Mm -hmm. But at this point, I am just so grateful that I get to be out here doing all of this. Mm -hmm. And I do think about whatever this attention is, but it's like, it's, it's the same way that I view and approach wealth. It's to be shared. It's not to be hoarded. It's mm -hmm. not to be boasted. Mm -hmm. It's to be, you know, it's like water. If it's, if it's stuck in a pond, it gets stagnant. Mm -hmm. it's, it has to keep moving mm -hmm. and it has to, it has to keep a connection to a way bigger picture. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's gonna be a ride that I can't even anticipate. <laughs> <laughs> so far, it's just been so touching and overwhelming to see, because you never really know how you're going to be received when mm -hmm. you have a spotlight on you. Mm -hmm. You never really know how, you never really know how that's gonna go, but it's been so wonderful for me um, to see how excited, like, my community, mm -hmm. like, my specific community from the Blackfeet Nation, um, my, my Nez Perce family as well. I always talk about being Blackfeet, but I'm just as much Nez Perce. Mm -hmm. um, my beloved grandmother passed away this last summer, who's mm -hmm. from Nimipu, from um, Lapway, Idaho, so I, I, I need to acknowledge that for her as well. Um, and my wonderful Nez Perce family. Um, so... My family, um, 
a lot of the people that I've worked with over the years, like now my Oklahoma family, Indian country at large, it's just been so touching the last week how many people have been supportive mm -hmm. and excited mm -hmm. and excited for this moment of representation that's mm -hmm. on this level of, mm -hmm. that's on this stage. It feels, it makes it manageable for me because it's not just mine, right. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a shared thing. Mm -hmm. There's so many people excited about this for me, but I'm like, I'm kind of excited about this for everybody right. then. Um, so yeah, yeah, just, we'll see what's to come, but right now I'm enjoying the view. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> well, we are all very excited to see what's to come. Congratulations. Thank I will be so there much. tonight. I can't wait to Yay. see it. And I believe we have time for one audience question. Um, yeah, okay. Hi, I have two questions for you. Okay. Uh, what is the biggest difference for you to be directed by Marty, as you call him, uh, or by Kelly Richard? <laughs> um, my second question is, do you have a special memory of the shooting of Jimmy P, our French filmmaker Arnaud de Plechin? Arnaud de Plechin. Oh, I love Arnaud. Okay, so... Marty and Kelly are, in a lot of ways, very similar directors, but very different people. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I can't really describe exactly other than just, you know, you get a sense of both of their personalities. Kelly's got this wonderful, dry humor, this warmth um, that I receive. I don't know if everybody would, um, but yeah, it's like Kelly's... Kelly's an incredible artist to work with, and both Marty and Kelly care so much about what you're bringing into it as an actor. I would say that's probably one thing that makes them both so great is when they cast you, they expect you to show up and show them what the scene is about, and then they come in and they, they, they tweak it. Um, but that's, that was the immense task, working with both of them, is, all right, um, I'm coming in and I'm knowing what I'm doing and I'm showing them what the scene is about and then they'll tell me if it's right or not. <laughs> um, and then Arno is, I loved working with Arno. I loved working on Jimmy P. That one was, that one was a long journey. Um, that's actually the reason I got my passport in 2012 was on the off chance I might be coming to <laughs> Cannes. <laughs> but I was such a small role in it, so of course. Um, but when... So Abby Kaufman was the casting director for that. I had been called in for one role, hadn't got it, read for another role, didn't get that, read for another role, didn't get that. So it was like every part that I auditioned for through the casting process was close, but no. And then this was filmed on my reservation. At, uh, my scene was at the train station where my mom used to go pick my dad up from commuting from Seattle for work and coming home when he would go do seasonal work. Um, and it was with Benicio. So, and I'd gotten that scene after production had already come to Montana. The community said, work with Lily Gladstone. And I was working in locals casting, helping you know, get other people into the film. And then finally, I was given a little speaking role. Um, it was on this train platform in a scene with Benicio. He and Arno were, um, were visiting about just kind of how the scene was going. And they had differing opinions about it. I very much defer to directors, um, so I, I weighed in. I said, I feel like you know my objective, my motivation, blah, 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 would be this. And then Benicio kind of nodded his head, and he said, okay, yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> and Arno was just so grateful to have that collaboration as well. It was, he, was, he was so lovely. He was clean. We got it in a few takes, two setups, three takes each. But it was kind of sweet in between um, setups, like Benicio stepped aside with me and he had been working so much with so many local talent in Browning at that point from my community um, that I think he was getting used to the fact that he was doing a lot of scenes with people who were non-actors. So when we stood aside, when they were changing the lens, um, he just said to me, he's like, you're an actor, aren't you? <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah, I am. And he said, you're good, keep doing it. So here I am at Cannes, finally. I renewed my passport, come back to Cannes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lily. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Thank you.